I'm David Snowbeck. I'm a uh, Drupal developer and entrepreneur. Today we're going to be talking about why 80 to 95 percent of startups fail every year and how you can beat the odds with Drupal. Uh, I have to confess that I stole the title Drupal Plus Startups Equals Awesome from uh, Matt Lechleider, the uh, organizer of the Chicago Drupal Meetup Group. Uh, but once you find the perfect title, I mean, how could I call it anything else? So, what is a startup? When you guys think of the word startup, what do you think of? Is it an actor? Yes. Yes. I want to say. Yeah. Shout something out. A company. <coughs> a cool idea. Yeah. No funding. Innovation. Anything else? No funding. Uh, <laughs> no funding. <laughs> Too much funding. Money. money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hard work, long hours. Threw a couple of things on here. So, you know, a tech startup uh, like Facebook that was launched in a dorm room and has investors and got venture capital and probably was powered by ramen noodles at some point is a startup. But I think it's a very limited definition of what a startup is. In fact, you might be building a startup and not even realize it. Many endeavors uh, that you wouldn't immediately think of as startups share the same challenges and problems, and so also share some of the same solutions that you could use to make your project successful. So I think it's really important that up front we discuss what a startup is just so that uh, you don't miss out on some useful information thinking that this doesn't apply to you. So if you're creating a new community forum, uh, open source project, nonprofit, even a new product at an established business, then you're probably building a startup. A startup is really defined by the unknowns. You have all these questions that you don't know the answer to. Uh, for example, you don't know who your ideal customer or community member is. A lot of people start out thinking something really broad, like everybody with a cell phone is a potential customer. But it's really hard to market to a big group, and it's really hard to make a big group happy. Like you can't make the perfect product for everyone. Someone's going to be dissatisfied. But you can make the perfect product for one very specific group of people, and really thrill them and blow their minds and create all this value for them. And they, in turn, will uh, either pay you a lot or contribute a lot to your community. And that specific group is going to be the core that keeps your community or your product going. Who are those people? Uh, you also don't know how you're going to acquire new customers or members. You know, <laughs> build it and they will not come. Even if you created the most awesome web app ever, if no one's heard of it, you know, they're never going to come and use it. So how will you reach them? Uh, you know, AdWords, blogging, YouTube, SEO, viral, cold calling, you know, all of those channels take time and effort to develop. So you can't develop them all. And really you wouldn't want to, since only a handful will probably work in your situation. So what are those channels? Uh, and what will it cost? There is always a cost of getting a new customer or a new community member, even if it's not in money. You know, even a free channel like blogging or SEO, someone has to sit down and create a ton of high quality articles on this topic for it to work. You're paying in time. So what will it take to get a new customer or community member? How will you get that new member of your community up to speed to being a contributing member of the community? And what is the value of your product or project to the customer? You know, which features or benefits will cause them to transition from a passive user to a contributing member or from a person doing the trial or a paying customer? And you may think you know, but you're wrong. Everybody gets this wrong. Uh, some famous examples, PayPal, their original product was to transfer money between PDAs. So PDAs, this is a device before smartphones, it probably didn't have internet access, and you would send money from your PDA to your buddy's PDA via the IR port, via infrared. That was their product. They created a web page as a demo so that people could get to understand the idea that it would allow you to transfer money via email. 
not because they really want to do that, but just you know, transfer via email. It's just like our real product with the PDA. And it turned out that people wanted that demo more than this other product, which they had spent you know, a million dollars of investment money building in a year. And uh, they ended up transitioning their business to that email product because that's the thing that customers actually wanted. Uh, Flickr started out as an online RPG, as a game. It was a massively multiplayer online RPG. And uh, there were people who played the game and loved the game, but what people really loved was sharing their pictures. And so they ended up transitioning to just a photo sharing website. So nobody gets this right on the first try or the first two or three tries. So are they willing to pay or join at all? I mean, there's a ton of uh, psychological studies that show that the difference between paying $1 and $100 is much bigger than the difference between free and even $1. So that resistance, once you get them paying something, you know, you can get them to pay more. But getting them to pay that something is huge. I think the same goes for like an open source project. Uh, it's easier to get a light contributor to become a heavy contributor than it is to get someone who's just a passive user to suddenly become a contributor. And how much will they pay or contribute? And will the value uh, that you get from each customer exceed uh, the cost that it takes to acquire each customer? And it sounds obvious that, like, yes, you want that. But it's a problem that every startup has, and it's not easy to solve. If you get uh, $100 on average from each customer, and it costs $50 to acquire them, that means for every customer you acquire, you have enough money to acquire one more. That's exponential growth. That's the hockey stick that everyone wants. But if you don't make that, it's death. I mean, you will have to struggle and hustle for each and every client. And as soon as you stop struggling and hustling, your business collapses. Same for an online community. An online community is defined by, the value is defined by the number of active members. The more active members, the more value that everyone in the community gets out of it. However, no one's an active member forever. You know, you join, you're active for a while, you go away. If, for example, uh, someone is an active member of your community for six months, on average, that means that each month you have to increase your user base by 17% to keep the exact same number of active members. So. To grow, you have to increase your user base by greater than 17% every month. And if you don't have a system where each new active member somehow helps you get more active members, you're going to slowly die out. So this is huge. This is you know, one of the main reasons that startups fail, because they don't know how to answer that question. So in established business, you already have answers to all these questions, or at least one answer that works for the time being. A startup is an organization where you don't have the answers, just some unknowns and some guesses. And it's your job to turn those unknowns into knowns before you run out of money or enthusiasm. <laughs> so I hope I've convinced you that startups don't have to be businesses. Um, However, it's way easier to talk about business examples because money is quantifiable. So the rest of my examples, mostly uh, through this presentation, will be business examples. So if you're building something that's not a business, you know, just use your imagination. All of this stuff applies equally to uh, non-business organizations. So you are building a startup. Awesome. Except 80 to 90% of startups fail every year. So why is that? Let's look at uh, the process that most failed startups follow. Step one, the founder is in the shower, this amazing idea hits them, they tell their friends, they tell their mother, they tell their spouse, everyone's like, yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. Step two, they settle in and they build this product to their vision for some ridiculous amount of money or time, sweat, and tears. This part could take a while. You know, the founder could churn on this for months or years before they think the product is ready. 
and probably they're not showing it to anyone uh, because someone might steal their idea. Step three, the product launches. The sales page is up. The big red buy now button is working. And real customers try the product for the first time. Maybe in the previous step, there were some beta users, people who got it for free, you know, some friend of the founder or something. But this is the first time someone has paid money for this product. Step four, no one buys it or even uses it. Or maybe they use it, but don't buy it. So the founder, if they're smart, will start talking to their customers, to their potential customers, and say, you know, what's going on? Side note, if the founder is not smart, they'll just start frantically changing things, hoping that, you know, it'll change their, uh, change their luck. Step six, whoops, we built the wrong product. And a lot of things could have happened. Um, maybe this customer group has a different problem that they'd be willing to pay for. But our product doesn't solve that problem. Or uh, maybe they think the product is great, they even love it for free. They'd never pay for that. Or maybe it does solve their problem, but the marketing and the customer acquisition process is all wrong. The product will never get to the customer it's intended to help. And even if they do come to our front page, they'll see it and be like, well, what the hell is this? They won't realize it's the right product for them. Or maybe one feature of the product is gold, like the Flickr example with the photo sharing, and all the rest of the stuff's just getting in the way. So we can scrap 90% of this product we just spent years and hundreds of thousands of dollars building and just focus on that 10% they'll actually buy. So why do most startups fail? The problem is with the process. Actually, there's a lot of problems with the process. Uh, looking at it laid out here, can you guys see any of them? Shout them out if you can. Um, no testing. No, no. It's an amazing idea to the founder, but there's no reason to think that it's an amazing idea to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, maybe he should have uh, talked to customers somewhere after coming up with the idea before spending the X thou hundreds of thousands of dollars on it. Absolutely. I think that's probably the biggest problem, but there's, there's others too. Any, any other ideas, guys? In the wrong product is a corollary. Everything past uh, four should be the two. You know, four, five, and six should all be somewhere after one. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess it's it's the the process. You know, not necessarily what happened. I mean, we could say people should have bought that. That would have been nice. But uh, <laughs> but you should you should have asked people how much they would pay or if they're willing to pay or absolutely, absolutely before launch. Well, hmm. before I, and after launch. Yeah. And and thinking about if it's the right product right away. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I think that's where you're getting at the six. I think there's one point yeah. five. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. How much is the founder willing to spend? Because really, <laughs> no, quite, frankly, really. quite frankly, if if it's a bet and this guy is going into this with some kind of open open view, mm -hmm. maybe he's willing to gamble fifty grand, whatever it is. I mean, the rest right. of this becomes subjective. I mean, because let's face it, entrepreneurs are gamblers. That's yeah. part of what this is about. So you have to sort of figure out what level of pain you're willing to accept. You put your whole life into this and product launches and then buys and blah, 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 blah. But you have to be able to stay enough to get to a certain point to do something. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't come in enough resources to get to number three. Yeah, that, that definitely they be the get case. stuck in the <coughs> amazing idea and they run out of money before they get a chance to launch it right then they're screwed. Right, because they start out with an idea that's so <laughs> big that they're just building and building and building. And See, I've had, I've had more, just anecdotally in my experience, I've worked with more startups that not have had a failure to launch, but have <laughs> number four. <laughs> <laughs> like, they spend $100,000 and, you know, yeah, again, yeah, like the... Uh, or or yes, even a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, well, sure. At that point, then they're on the money. Right? Yeah, yeah. At that point, they do. Or, but or not we, before launch. They actually do launch, mm -hmm. but it's not right. Or or even a hundred thousand dollars in in time. I mean, some people will come up with an idea in like 
churn on it and churn on it for two years, they'll put like thousands of hours into this thing and then launch it. Uh, nothing happens. You know, that time is worth something. And also the amount of money you lose by quitting your job in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. That delta becomes stunning when you consider I spent some savings and didn't make this money. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you can be in those six figures real quick. Yeah, yeah. And some of, some of the other um, things that I put in my notes about uh, problems here is you, know, you probably should have gotten to that big of a number before you launched since you're, it's, you're going to lose it all and still have further to go, right? Um, there's nothing on here about marketing or customer acquisition or price. That's just kind of ignored. You know, we know we need one, right? But it, it's never part of it. You know, if you look at some of the successful startups, they didn't, you know, they beat the odds. They didn't have any. I think Facebook had a lot of marketing beforehand. Oh shit. Sure. No, mm -hmm. but they, uh, had, they, had, they had a very specific uh, target customer. The mm -hmm. students at a particular yeah. university, they had a really great way to reach them. They had a fantastic growth strategy. Every new user they brought on brought with them a ton of other new users. I mean, success is never immediate, but they had all of the proximas for this is probably a good idea from the very, very beginning. I think a big point in the difference between, or one of the big points too is are you building a startup to be a business that you and your lady and five other people can live comfortably off of? Or are you building a startup for merger acquisitions and VC funding and being the next big startup that we can all talk about because it's been covered and we hear about it and it's worth a billion dollars and has a private IPO and all this crap, right? So like, it depends what you're building too. I think like those that in my mind those are two distinct paths. Am I building the next big product or service, or am I building a business? Stable, something stable. A stable, a business that makes a million dollars a year. You know, that's not attractive to VCs or an incubator or something like that. But it's totally still a startup. <laughs> it's still a business, I argue. Yeah, I think that, and that has to be even leaner. I think that even drives you to yeah. the more leanness that you have to be. I, I definitely think you know there's there's different things you do at different times whether you are going for one target or the other but a lot of the strategies that will help you succeed are the same for both mm -hmm. you know they're just mm -hmm. delivered in different amounts at different times anyway uh, moving on a different process a better process uh, lean startup who's heard of lean startup so we've got Kevin and my wife who saw the presentation earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so. Lean Startup is a methodology for systematically developing businesses and products. Uh, this previous system was built on guesses and hope. There really isn't a system here. <coughs> Whereas Lean Startup is a system to try and reduce your risk, it's never zero, try and reduce your cost, again, never zero, um, and you know, increase your chances for success. The simplest explanation I can give to software developers or project managers is it's like Agile, but for building a startup. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have time to talk about everything involved in it, uh, just the big points. If you're interested in, in learning more, the definitive resource is the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. So Lean Startup integrates customer interaction as a core part of the process. It's not something you save to later, it's something you're always doing throughout the whole thing from day one. Uh, it combines developing the business with developing the product. So you're not waiting to the end to answer questions like price and customer acquisition and all that stuff. You're doing it at the same time as you're building the product and allowing the two to interact. Mm -hmm. And rather than a linear process from start to finish, it's a cycle, a feedback loop. And that feedback loop is learn, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, build, measure. Uh, you start, you know, over here with ideas, hypotheses, some customer interviews, maybe some research. Then you build a little something that customers, potential customers, can try. You measure was that a success, and you take that back into your learning stage. Come up with some new hypotheses. Talk to customers again, and keep going around and around. So one of the core ideas of Lean Startup is that you list out all of your assumptions and guesses and you test them 
one by one. And the ones that you test first should be the riskiest assumptions. The ones that if it turned out that the answer was no, your startup is not viable. The biggest risk is not, can we build it? Given enough time, resources, money, it's 100% guaranteed that you can build any web app. Um, unless you know, you're building something where it's not even sure that the technology is possible, um, which you're probably not. If you are, let me know, because that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest risks actually are, does anyone even want it? Will they pay for it? How much? How will you find new customers, and what will that cost? These are the things that kill startups. So if you want to increase your chances of success, you need to either answer those earlier or fail earlier. Honestly, not all startup ideas are viable. Maybe uh, it's too early for the idea. You know, it's a great idea, but you know, society isn't ready for it. Maybe the cost just doesn't work out. You could build it, but it would cost too much, so no one would buy it. Maybe your team is not the team to build that. Uh, you know, one team might have connections into this world and know these people, and this other team might not. Uh, so a specific idea might not be successful, but so long as you can keep discarding those ideas that you can't do, you will eventually be successful, unless you run out of money or enthusiasm. So let me, let me just interject something. What Kevin said was like profound. There are plenty of startups who don't have any customers. They have an idea to go to venture capital, they blow smoke up their ass, they get money for the project. But none of this, you know, does anyone even want it? It's lots of times it can't be demonstrated. I mean, you know, look at some of the projects that have come out that people have paid for, they funded for development. They get funded, yeah, I mean, but that's just yeah. people with money making bad decisions. I think yeah. that you can, uh, gather evidence for an idea being potentially successful really, really early on. Um, and the, the, there are, of course, people who just build a thing without checking and it works out. But I think the majority of successes are people who did things that you know, gave them evidence of success early on, like Dropbox is worth a billion dollars or whatever. They're, they originally came out with a video saying, you know, look at what Dropbox could be, and they got tons of people to pay and uh, get on board before anything was done. You know, they had this huge metric for possible success. Nothing's ever guaranteed. You know, before sitting down in your cave and putting it together. Anyway, we'll get we'll get more into that in a little what bit. About, what about the risk of somebody then stealing your idea? You make it faster and better. Don't ever worry about that. So, I mean, that risk does exist. Sure. But um, it's not the reason that most startups fail. Uh, if you can find an example of a startup that failed like that, that'd be awesome. <laughs> it seems like just like a, you know, a nightmare fear that people would have that I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare yeah. feeling I experience all of time, everywhere with all, and it's a lot of time first time entrepreneurs, usually, or people have worked in a Fortune 50 company and said, I can do this on my own. And like, uh, it, I, I tell people, my favorite quote is, Execution eats ideas for breakfast. Yes. <laughs> like if you're I, executing, I've seen people with ideas, and then and then they fail. I see someone else try the same idea and it fails, and then I see someone else try the same idea and it succeeds. The thing, so you're not stealing anybody's idea by making no. it succeed. You're just doing what they couldn't do. And the thing that I hate even worse than all three of those is when someone comes up to you and says, "Oh, I had an idea." <laughs> after you built, after you made a thing, <laughs> and then they come back to you have the balls to say, "Oh, I thought of that." <laughs> I can do that, I thought that. I'm just as good as you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, always tell people too that um, people love their own ideas more than other people's ideas. <laughs> if you tell someone's idea and they steal it, like, uh, that's, you know, unheard of. They'll think like, no, I got this better idea that I've been saving in my special ideas chest. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I've never heard of a startup fail uh, because someone stole their idea. If there is one, I would love to have the example just to... Yeah, I'd say the only time that can... The thing, and this you should plan for, is the idea of an incumbent coming in and making your product a feature. Like, how easy is your product can become a feature? Like, my startup is, is ideally going to cannibalize three very small websites, mm -hmm. plus. Because these things do one thing and they don't do them well. So we're gonna do that, and do it well, and do this. So it's like, but then we don't think 
there are certain things in our stuff that can be cannibalized in any sort of technical way because it's not technical. That's the secret. So, anyway. Yeah, I, I also, uh, to sort of add more to that, uh, fast followers, I think, are a bigger worry than people stealing your idea early on. Once you've proven that it's successful, you yeah. come out and you make a big splash, like you're making all this money, 10 people, even big names, will try to copy you because they already know the idea is good. And that's when you really have to worry, um, not, not when it's nowhere. So, we know we need to talk to customers and figure out what they want, so should I just like ask them, hey, customer, what do you want? We buy this? <laughs> no, no. Because <laughs> they have no idea what they want. If you ask customers directly what they want, they'll either ask for the world, it should wake you up in the morning, dress you, feed your cat, and cost nothing, or they'll ask you for an extension of something they already know or do, which is probably not the optimal solution to the problem. It's not their job to innovate. It's yours. What you should instead do is show them a solution and get them to pay for it. Not um, ask them, will they pay for it? Because they might say yes, but then not actually do it. And it's not necessarily because they're lying or trying to be nice. The psychology of buying is totally different than the psychology of anything else. So you can't really tell a person, like, put your mind in buying mode and now answer this question. You actually have to create a real buying situation for them and put them there in order to get an honest answer. And they'll lie just as much the other way around. They'll tell you that they would buy it and then they won't. <laughs> right. <laughs> but People either way, yeah, yeah, you're correct. So, if you need to sell them something, how can you sell them a solution before your product exists? And that's where the minimum viable product comes in. Uh, this is a tool from the Lean Startup Toolbox to try and answer exactly this question. It's a product that provides the core value proposition, meaning it actually solves the customer's main problem. It costs money or equivalent if you're doing something non-monetary, maybe that could be a sign up or something. You have to get them to, to commit in some way. But it's not the full product. So it only does just enough to provide this core value proposition. <gasps> and probably it doesn't scale. So having an MVP allows you to do many things. You can see if your approach actually solves the problem it claims to solve. If you build a free website that does people's taxes, and they join and try it and find out it's rubbish and leave, you won't ever know. If they hand you $10 and go try your product, I mean, you're going to know. You'll probably have to give them a refund. <laughs> but you'll definitely get honest feedback on, this did not solve my problem. It will help you see if people will actually pay for it and allow you to experiment on super important things like price and segmentation. Should it cost $10? Should it cost $100? Should there be one version? Or should there be a basic and a pro version? I mean, all that stuff makes a huge difference in whether your business can grow, and you can uh, answer it without building a full product. My favorite was doing price discrimination based on whether you're on an Apple or a PC. <laughs> <laughs> you have to raise prices if you're on a Mac. That what totally makes what, sense, though. What product did that? I think you uh, some large manufacturer. Large vendor. Mm -hmm. It's a large vendor, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, I mean, if it doesn't cost more, they're going to think it's cheap. How can they tell if you're on a Mac? If it, oh, you can browser 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 a lot, the MVP also allows you to test uh, your marketing, your customer acquisition, channels. Um, allows you to make changes quickly and see what effect it has. You know, the button's blue, now will people buy? The button's green, now will they buy? <laughs> and do all of this before wasting time and money building the full product. So here's an example, a real world example. Mayo Finch. 
Uh, Mailfinch provides a web app and an API to allow people to send real snail mail. So a real piece of paper in an envelope that comes into your real mailbox. When I see a description like this, as a software developer, I start thinking like, oh, we're gonna need a message queue, and we're gonna need some special printer hardware, and you know, we're gonna need all this stuff, and start really thinking about the engineering problems. Uh, but that's not what um, Paul Singh, the founder of Mailfinch, did. Uh, he created MVP first, which he talked about during his Mixergy interview. I put some bits from the transcript, but don't read them while I'm talking. Um, <coughs> Uh, if you haven't heard of Mixergy, it's an awesome site. Uh, interviews with uh, startup founders. For a while, he was putting up interviews every day. I don't know if he still does that. Uh, but the MVP for Mailfinch was a single web page with a text box where you pasted in your uh, letter you wanted to send, another text box where you put the address to send it to, and a submit button. It took you to PayPal, you paid $3, and it sent Paul an email. And Paul would actually take the uh, information from the form that he got in an email, put it in Microsoft Word, print it up, print it out on his inkjet, put it in an envelope, and walk to the mailbox with it. That was the original MVP. Nice. And uh, this allowed him to do really amazing things and actually develop his MVP into a full product and a successful business. He asked everyone who uh, sent something uh, via email if they would do a call with him and he talked with two customers every day and from those customer interviews really drove all of the changes that he made to the product. Uh, after talking with a number of different types of customers he realized that real estate agents were the ideal customer. They were the people who experienced the most pain and got the most value and he could tell this from, from talking to them and uh, it turns out that at real estate agencies, the bottom guys, like the people who made the least sales, have to come in on a Saturday, once a month, print out all these newsletters, like 800 of them, and mail them by hand. So it's a huge pain. And talking to customers, uh, he added a number of features. Uh, they were complaining that uh, they would have to enter their return address every time they sent a letter. So, okay, yeah, I'll add user accounts, a profile, you put your return address in there. And after he added it, he just, didn't just add it and forget about it, he was able to see that uh, this increased people's usage of the app. It helped increase sales, so he could see that value went up. There was an actual effect on the business. Uh, from talking with the real estate guys, he found out that normally, before his product, they were making these newsletters as PDFs and printing them off at Kinko's or whatever. So, okay, I'll add a PDF upload. Now there's even more usage of my app. You know, sales became easier since these real estate guys turn up and, oh, PDF, I'll just put it right there, we're done. Contacts was actually something he, he fought at and customers kept asking, uh, you know, we want to have a contacts list in there because we're sending, you know, to the same people all the time. And like, contacts list, it's all this functionality, I don't really want to add that. Um, but he eventually, they won him over, he added it, and it actually ended up being really core for the business. He found out that once people put in their contacts, the application became sticky. They were now less likely to go do something else. They've made the commitment to putting their contacts in, and now they were more loyal. Their customer attention went up, which he could see from watching the way people used his MVP. He didn't see those things ahead of time, huh? He didn't even know who the product was for. He just threw up the thing and said, hey, we'll see who uses this. <laughs> told everybody knew to go check it out, and they told people they knew, and you know, it just sort of went from there. You know, you can come up with an idea, but an idea is kind of a solution looking for a problem. You know, and I guess this was a solution looking for a problem too, but you know, a, another totally valid way is to say, you know, what are your problems? How can I solve them with technology? And uh, so, he found a problem a little later on, but then kept gearing his product more towards it and kept building a more stable business out of it. So anyway, uh, he also noticed that people, when they first signed up, would pay to send a letter to themselves. Uh, you know, they needed to test it out, see if it looked professional before they trusted it for their business. He said, oh, people are doing that. I'll give them a free test letter that goes to their return address as soon as they sign up. Increased sales. 
you know, he's also able to experiment with price, marketing, how to get new customers, you know, should I charge per email, should I have them pay a monthly fee, uh, you know, should I segment based on quantity, all that stuff he was able to play with from day one. Uh, once he knew it was real estate agents, he could have his marketing copy say like, hey, real estate agent, don't you hate going in on Saturday and sending all those newsletters? You know, that converts way better than, what did I describe this as when we opened um, a web app and API for sending real world snail mail. Like, you know, once you know who your customer is, you can make much higher converting uh, sales materials. And once you know it's real estate agents, your path for acquiring new customers, you've got real estate uh, publications, you've got uh, conferences, all that stuff. And later, at the time of the interview, uh, he said he was talking with HP Xerox Canon to build custom printer parts to actually automate the process. Uh, he had gotten from MVP to servicing you know, lots and lots and lots of people by uh, hiring interns. <laughs> but you know, he had finally gotten to the stage that I would have started at personally, just thinking about the problem. You know, but at this point, he now knows the business can't be successful. He knows a ton about it. He knows how to take it from where it is now to where it could be. So he's in a much better position to start think about, thinking about automation. So some quick non-businessy MVP examples. These are just ideas for how you can do an MVP for um, these types of projects, uh, just so I don't leave anyone out. A uh, community forum, you could start with a video or a purpose article and ask people to sign up or make an introductory post. Where signing up and making an introductory post is like paying. That's the, the threshold you're trying to get them over. It's not as the same psychologically, but it's more than they came and looked at it for a second and thought, oh, that's clever. So you can start to build proof to see if your community forum will actually be successful. An open source project, uh, you can put the simplest code that could possibly work on GitHub and try to get people to contribute. Don't write all the features. If you're going to sit down and try to make it into a complete project, you've just created a scenario where you're going to be the only contributor forever. This is you and your lonesome. If what you really are going for is a project that people contribute to, they you know actively come and help, you should put the simplest thing that works and then really try to drive them to contribute. These are some things that could be done. These are uh, how you get started and all that stuff. And if they start to contribute, hey, maybe you've got something that could grow. Uh, Nonprofits, start with a video purpose article, ask them to donate, you know, give us 20 bucks and let's try and make this new cool nonprofit that the world needs exist. Uh, it's like a Kickstarter. So, I personally believe that Drupal is an ideal platform to build your MVP, and let me tell you why. Uh, the best MVP is one that you can get in front of customers as soon as possible. Uh, one that you can build with as little investment and time and effort as possible, and one that you can iterate and change as quickly as possible. And I think that Drupal fits the bill. Uh, other platforms could definitely work here too, uh, you could make a lot of the same arguments I'm about to make about Drupal, about WordPress, and I actually had asked Brad to speak about this today, but he hasn't turned up. So Brad will not speak about this at the end. <laughs> <coughs> so one of the things that makes this possible with Drupal is the enormous number of contrib modules. It allows you to get the basics that any MVP or startup product is going to need with very little effort. You can get login, third-party login, mailing list marketing, your marketing materials, hey, it's a CMS, uh, analytics, surveys, customer support, all that stuff. But even more than that, oh, and by the way, uh, these links, I'll post the presentation later, but they actually go to Drupal modules that I believe do those things well, in case you want to grab them. So not only the basics, but I think you can actually implement 80% of your app without writing any code. If you want to do something, there's a module for it. Uh, if you want a forum, there's a, a bunch of modules for that. Um, if you want an activity stream like you have in Facebook, oh, three modules for that one. Uh, friending, liking, video processing, if you want to make your own YouTube, uh, all sorts of mapping stuff. This is a video I'm working on. <laughs> uh, build a Facebook clone in 10 minutes without writing any code. Uh, I wasn't able to finish it for today. Hopefully I'll be able to finish it for uh, 
uh, Drupal Camp Fox Valley, but um, it's going to be a video. It'll run in fast motion. If you did it, really, it would take an hour or two. But a 10-minute video just clicking through all of the interface to build a Facebook clone without writing any code. And I think you could do that with pretty much any big startup. I plan to make videos for that do the same thing for uh, YouTube, Twitter. In the end, you only up, end up writing code for whatever the unique value proposition of your product is. You know, I hear a lot of startup ideas where it's like Facebook, but for cats. <laughs> you know, if you want to get all of the Facebook stuff done, like you can do that, no problem. And then you're just doing custom things that are necessary for cats. You know, whatever the thing is that makes your product unique, you only spend time writing code for that, the last 20%. So I think it allows you to get through the learn, build, measure process quicker than other products uh, because there's so much you can do without writing code. On a really Drupal savvy team, even non-coders like experienced site builders could contribute to the building part. You're not stuck on the one coder like he's the only guy who can go change that. You know, you can really plow through this process quicker. And it can grow with you beyond your MVP. Uh, we all know Drupal is enterprise capable. It's handling some of the biggest sites on the internet. It, I would say Drupal is one of the better uh, solutions for handling really big sites. And while scaling is not easy on any platform, all of the tools and techniques for scaling to a massive site are well known and well documented. Uh, so this is my last, my last slide. Um, MVP creator, a Drupal distribution for building MVPs. Everyone knows what a Drupal distribution is, right? Uh, you install Drupal normally and it doesn't do anything. It has no <laughs> goal, no purpose. Uh, a Drupal distribution is a collection of modules and some setup code that uh, gives it a purpose. Um, this is one of my projects. Uh, it barely exists. It's super alpha. It is, a, it is an early, early stage startup itself. But it's something I really want to build. Um, and there is a project on Drupal.org, and you can download it. I will install. Uh, it just doesn't have much interest in it. Uh, the goals of the project are to have up-to-date and secure versions of all the most popular modules already there for you. So you don't have to go search for the best X. Hopefully, I already have it in there and up-to-date. This is the part that does exist to some degree. I have like the top 100 modules, and every time a new release and a security update comes out, I update it. Um, it's also based on Panoply, so you get all of the cool user interface improvements you get with Panoply, WYSIWYG, and all that. Um, you get same defaults for site builders. When Drupal comes up originally, it's kind of like not totally geared towards a site builder. A lot of the UI, like field UI, is it there? Um, so this turns on all of those UI modules. You get views UI, you get field UI. It's ready to, to sit down and start building. And I think the really important thing to build, which I haven't gotten to yet, uh, would be to make pre-made features. A feature is a module that has dependencies and configurations, so you turn it on and it does a thing. For all of the stuff that most star uh, startups need, most MVPs need. So you could just click a box and get a third party login with Facebook, Twitter, uh, all that stuff. Follow in a box and then walk through to copy your API to use it. Um, you know, if you needed a blog, you just click blog and turn on the blog module. So really, a Drupal distribution to build MVPs even faster. So um, yeah, if you guys are interested in jamming about what we could make this to be. Uh, I'd love to talk about it more. Yeah. Hey, I had that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Come help me. It's open source. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, this infographic shows uh, a really detailed version of the Lean Startup Build, Learn, Measure cycle. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, Lean Running by Ash Maria is a really awesome book. Uh, if you're a details, numbers, specifics person, which I totally am, this is the better Lean Startup book. Eric Reese's is very high level, uh, businessy, talking about concepts. This is numbers and specifics. Uh, so I, I love that. And then those are the people I stole the photos from. Originally, 
I was going to ask Brad to talk about uh, how the same sort of benefits are present in WordPress and the WordPress community, but he's not here, so WordPress loses. Uh, <laughs> I also had uh, asked Kevin to share some of his experience. I know uh, Kevin's worked on some startups for other people and has an idea about a travel-based startup. Uh, so yeah, if you have anything to say about your experience or why you would choose Drupal for a startup. Oh, we really cover a lot of it. The, the quickness to get things launched and just the, really the, then the extensibility to continue to build on it are the two big things. Um, yeah, you really hit on a bunch of the reasons why we picked it and where I used it for what's really basically a more of a journalistic travel website. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So that's, that's my presentation. I really need to have like a here am I and here's how you can contact me page, which I don't have. Um, but um, other than that, uh, what do you guys think of the presentation, like just critiques on the presentation?